Welcome everyone to Glugnet for August 2021. Uh, my name is Joe Kunk. I am the event coordinator and uh, Steve Ball is uh, on vacation this week. So you get me to do the Master of, uh, Ceremon Master of Ceremonies uh, uh, duties. So um, tonight I want to point to everyone before we get started, I want to point to the chat window, check out the chat window. There is a link to review, uh, submit a feedback session on this uh, presentation. If you provide the feedback, you will be entered into a drawing for a, a JetBrains giveaway and basically it's any one of their products and including their ultimate package. And we'd encourage you to provide feedback. That link is in the chat. Uh, that uh, survey will take you only a couple minutes to complete if that. And it's gonna be open until Friday uh, night at 8 p.m. So you got a little time, but don't forget to do it. Um, we'd love to see that somebody take that uh, and, and make use of that pro uh, JetBrains product. We we need people to uh, enter the and take the surveys and win the product and install it because if we don't have someone do that so many months in a row, they will can they will quit offering it to us. So uh, please help us out and make the survey and and do that. Um, for those on the recording, if it's too late, sorry. Um, tonight we have Dave McCarter. Uh, Dave is someone that I know from my MVP Summit days, which was some while ago. So I know he's been an MB MVP for quite a while. Uh, and uh, uh, excellent speaker. I've enjoyed his presentations uh, every time I've uh, had that opportunity to attend uh, various conferences. Um, Dave. Uh, I'll let you kind of give your own bio, your own background. I think you could do it better than I can. Um, but we are very honored to have you tonight, and thank you. Thanks. So it's my turn now? Yes. <laughs> well, uh, welcome, everybody, uh, to, to Rock Your Code Coding Centers for Microsoft.net. Um, I'm, I'm excited. I, would, I wish there were more people, but I'm excited because I haven't actually done this talk in a while. So um, it was nice to refresh myself and update the data and stuff like that um, the last couple of weeks. Um, but I'm glad you're here. I hope more people show up. And uh, if they don't, then it's going to be really intimate. Uh, so um, please ask questions. I'm, there's actually sec, uh, sessions, uh, <laughs> areas in my talk where I've got to stop and ask you questions. And so that should be pretty easy if there's only five of us here. So. <laughs> uh, so make sure you have your keyboard ready. I'm going to be asking you some uh, answers. I, uh, or maybe if there's only a few of us, you guys can just say it on the microphone, I guess. I, I, we were just talking about this, a little bit about speaking. You know, I, I love speaking in person. It's my favorite thing to do. Um, I'm not a big fan of speaking virtually, uh, but uh, I, I do the best I can uh, during the, the, you know, the, the time we've had with COVID. So here's here's some pictures of me, you know, speaking at uh, uh, different conferences. Um, most of those are all from uh, India, and uh, and I, I speaking at conferences is one of the things I just really love doing, and I can't wait to get back to doing it again. And at some conferences, if you're lucky enough, uh, well, this hasn't happened in America too much, but um, at some conferences they even have me play guitar, and in India they have me smash the guitar, as you can see there. And throw all the pieces out in the audience, and the audience goes crazy. And and uh, I actually play like a set before I do that, and uh, it's uh, literally the funnest thing I've ever done in my life, pretty much. Uh, so I hope to I hope to get back to India next year and uh, uh, break one of the cheap Indian guitars and throw it out in the audience. Uh, of course, I wouldn't break one of mine. Mine are too expensive. So yeah, I'm David McCarter. I, I hope some of you know me, some of you might not. I'm a Microsoft and C Sharp Corner MVP. This is actually my 15th year being a Microsoft MVP. Um, I'm an award-winning developer, architect, and consultant is mostly what I do these days. I'm also a patented inventor. Um, I'm also an award-winning photographer. I've won four photography awards in the largest contest in California. And I'm a musician and I, do lots of other stuff. So there's my um, uh, email, there's my uh, uh, Twitter, please uh, tweet me anytime you want or follow me. And there's my LinkedIn if you wanna uh, connect that way. I'm always looking for uh, a great place to work, um, being a consultant. Um, so this talk is based off of my book. Um, I don't know how well, oh, I can see myself. So here's my latest uh, version of my book. It's the biggest book I've ever 
uh, published on my own. It's uh, uh, 300 and some odd, uh, 328 pages. So it's uh, my biggest self-published book. So, um, you know, this talk just barely scratches the surface of what's in my book. So for this talk, um, I try to pick on things that I see happen over and over again in code bases. And since I'm a since I'm a um, a consultant, you know, I I see a lot of code. Unfortunately, most of it all really bad. And uh, so um, uh, that's basically one of the reasons I wrote this book is because of that. And um, so I hope you go pick up a copy. It's available on uh, Amazon. Um, the current copy is not an available ebook, but you, if you're using a .NET framework or something like that, you can still you can get that on ebook. Um, this this um, new version and all my new books will all be .NET five and above. I'm I've, I've left uh, uh, .NET Core and .NET Framework behind, so um, at least I'm not going to be writing anymore about that. I still code it if I have to, but um, um, so I also have my code performance book. I did my code performance talk at a group in New York uh, last week. Um, I'm really, really big in the performance these days, especially with the cloud. So I hope you pick up a copy of that. Um, the latest version of that is for .NET Core and .NET Framework. Um, but the next version, of course, will be .NET 6. And then if you're looking for a new position, um, I hope you pick up uh, Surviving uh, David McCarter, Rocky Career, Surviving the Technical Interview. Um, I've had this book for I guess 11 years now, I guess, dang. And uh, um, and I wrote that because of my frustration of interviewing people. <laughs> and so this was my solution. Uh, Cause when I when I started writing that book, I was you know interviewing every .NET developer that came in the company and I, I got really frustrated. So um, I wrote a book about it. So hopefully you'll pick it up and hopefully you're seeing the screen and everything okay. I know that background video can kind of mess things up sometimes. Excuse me, David. Yep. You have that. Did you say you're going to uh, get off um, .NET Core and .NET Framework for .NET yes. 6? Uh, at least for writing. I'm, I'm only doing .NET 5 and .NET 6 now. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, writing book, articles. Yes. And your book about interviewing, has that evolved over the years or is it pretty much the Oh, same? yeah. It's it's on okay. its fifth edition, I think. The fifth, fourth edition, I think. So yeah, every couple right. of years I, I do a new uh I do a new release. Um I update it and do a new release. Yeah. And the coding standards book I um updated um beginning of last year. Um Okay. Yeah. So um I'm not sure when I'm gonna update that for .NET six. Um but uh we'll see. Uh anyway. I also have a really popular uh, weekly show on the internet called uh, Rockin' the Code World with .NET Dave. Um, it's on csharpcorner.com. Um, I hope you'll uh, come see it. I have big wigs from you know the big people at Microsoft all the way down to normal developers just like you and me. Um, I interview every week on my show and um, I average about five to 13,000 viewers per show. So I hope you'll... Uh, uh, Come watch the show. I really enjoy doing the shows, and I think they're fun and, and fun to watch. And also, I give away software every uh, show too. So if you want to win uh, refactoring tools, um, I give that away every uh, show. So actually, everybody who watches gets a copy. It's not a it's not a giveaway really, I guess. All right. So this is what I'm going to talk about today. And like I said before, I'm going to be asking questions. This is really your talk, especially since there's not many people here. Uh, if you have questions, please stop me and I'll try to answer them the best I can. Um, but have your keyboards ready because there will be some questions we're going to be asking you as a whole uh, to see where your, you guys are at. I'm going to have some challenges for you too. So um, hopefully you've had your, uh, uh, you haven't started uh, drinking beer yet or anything. Um, so today we're going to do opening act basically. The opening act for me is always why I'm doing these talks. Um, application setup, which is uh, something I never see done correctly, and Visual Studio doesn't really help you with that much. Um, coding issues. These are coding issues I see all the time. I still see them. Actually, even right now, I still see these issues and because I started a new contract a couple of years ago. I mean, a couple of years ago, a couple of weeks ago. And then writing better code, um, which is a section just about mostly about object-oriented programming. 
odds and ends and then encore and then you guys can go watch Netflix and then it's dinner time for me. Um, so that's what we're going to do today. Um, here's opening act. That's one of the bands that I've hung out with a couple times. If you ever get to check them out, they're a little heavy, but uh, I love them. Anyway, so this is part one of my series called Improving Code Quality One Developer at a Time. There's all the other sessions. I did the uh, uh, performance talk last week, and uh, and you can see all those other sessions. And some of the, a lot of what I've uh, done is also um, not only in my books, but I write a lot, a lot about this stuff. So, and I have a I have like 80 videos you can go watch too. So, um, so why are standards needed? So I always stop here, and we'll see how it works with the chat, but. Um, those of you who believe in coding standards, why do why do you use coding standards where you work? Either say it or or chat it. Uh, make so sure you unmute yourself. <laughs> from my perspective, I think coding standards are essential because uh, one person can pick up where another person left off, and in addition, you can read each other's code and be able to essentially fill in for each other. Yes. Exactly. Um, and also, since I've, I've been onboarding uh, uh, with a new company, you know, it's, believe me, if you have well-written, documented coding standards, onboarding at a new company is a heck of a lot easier, um, which, again, I don't see a lot being done correctly that way. But yeah, anybody else have something they want to say about why they do coding standards? I think I feel the same. Um, Sam, it was, uh, but there's also sometimes like I get, you know, like certain things that I like to see. Like um, I like having like an if statement with a curly brace is always, I never like to have it without it. So it's like yeah. one of those, it just helps enforce like things that I like, even though it doesn't yeah. really matter. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and some of the things I'll, I'll be talking about, um, depending on what I'm showing is, you know, sometimes we do things for readability, you know, sometimes we do things for performance, sometimes, you know, there's different ways of coding the same thing. There's a hundred ways of doing it, right? Um, but the most important thing with coding standards is that you should be able, I should be able to look at your code and be able to, to be, to understand it really easily so I can make modifications or fix or whatever. Uh, anybody else before we move on? Nope. Okay. So, um, the one thing I always say in this talk is that, um, you might not agree with everything and you probably won't and that's okay. You know, the whole point of this talk and, and my book is to to get you at least talking and, and doing something about it. Uh, because 100% you know, of the companies I go to have no coding standards. Or And when I say no coding standards, I mean documented, well-documented coding standards that is given to all the developers when they start. I've yet to find a company that does that. Um, now, most companies, when they hire me, uh, they buy everybody a copy of my book and that's the coding standard. So I make a couple bucks, but really, you know, the biggest thing is, you know, I get, we all are on the same page. And and I think that's, you know, one of the first things here. So pick a standard for your company, whatever that is. Every company should have a standard. Um, I don't care if, if you have, if you have two or more people, you have to have a standard to me. Um, and I think you guys said this, every programmer on the same page, we should be able to, you know, read everybody else's code very easily, right? And I can't say this as much for like .NET Core and .NET 5, but, you know, if you look at the .NET framework, if you look at the actual code of the .NET framework, it all looks like it's written by the exact same person, right? And that's really what you're striving for. You, you should be able, it should, you should not be able to tell who wrote it, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, so super, super important. And I'll be talking a lot about this throughout the talk. Um, um, easier to read and understand code readability is um, super important uh, because it makes it easier to maintain, right? And to add features, right? And I, I always say, how many people wrote code and never changed it? Yeah, it never happens, right? So uh, you have to make stuff that's really easy. You don't want people sitting there for 30 minutes trying to figure out what the hell this code does Right, you should be able to look at it and go, oh, okay, I know. Um, and if you follow everything in my book and what other people might teach you, uh, produces more stable, reliable code, right? Stable code, because I don't like being called on the weekends. Um, 
so I have the survey out. If you if you go to the my blog page about this, you can go participate in it. Um, because I always try to keep ever since I've been doing this talk, which has been what eleven years now, I always try to keep up with you know what people are doing. And and I ask people, does your team use coding standards? Um, I don't believe this number at all. <laughs> Because most people say yes, and I don't believe it. Because most companies I go to don't have any coding standards, so I don't believe this number. But that's 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 what my survey uh, produces. Um, so uh, I'm just trying to you know hit home that the coding standards are super super important, especially if you're in a large team like I am right now. I think that there's in my team everybody included. I think there's like 15 people or something. So. Um, one thing in all my talks and all my books and everything I write is I never show fake code. I always show real stuff and real stats and all that. I don't make things up. And uh, I can't really make up bad code anymore because I've been, I've been so into coding standards for so long, it's really hard for me to write bad code. Um, so this is from a real project that I worked on, um, unfortunately, um, this year. <laughs> So this is a real in-production project. Has 3,300 warnings, right? Which is warnings to me are, are, are a yellow light, meaning it's gonna turn red and you have to fix those. So it's 3,300 warnings. Luckily they have no errors, so it builds, but they do have uh, 3,300 um, warnings. They have 28,000 suggestions and messages. I've never seen that number. That's the biggest number I've ever seen for the uh, for a, a single solution. Um, bad, you know, because one thing I say when I show these huge numbers is that no manager, if you go to any manager and say, hey, we need to stop for six months a year and clean up our code, then they're gonna say, sure, go do that. No, <laughs> it doesn't happen, right? Because cleaning up your code doesn't sell code, doesn't sell product, right? Um, feature sell products. So managers don't care. And we'll talk a little bit about that um, at the end of the session. Um, I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, but uh, a single project has a cyclomatic complexity of 38,071. And I'll talk what that number means to me later, but just remember that number in your head, 38,000, okay? <laughs> and that's just one project. There's 82 projects, right? Um, and uh, class coupling, one project does a class coupling of 3,300, more than 3,300, which is bad. On top of that, I saw very little um, uh, code for globalization and localization, which is very, very important. I'm only gonna barely talk about that in this talk, uh, but it's super, super uh, important subject because most code has to deal with different languages and different cultures. Um, so if you do that in the beginning of your coding, it's, it's, it's so easy to do. But I've been through, ever since the 90s, I've been through globalization projects and they all are super painful because people don't do some of the things that I, I tell you in my books when they first code. 32,000 spelling issues. <laughs> I've never seen that number either. Um, I, I know we all can't spell, we all have dyslexia and ADD, I know that. Um, but this is pretty bad, especially if that gets in the production code. Um, and, and get this, 217,000 lines of clones. <laughs> I've never seen that number either. It's the biggest number I've ever seen, which means this code base is a maintenance nightmare, right? Because all of those lines of code shouldn't be there, right? You shouldn't have code clones in your code. Um, so uh, excuse me, David. In yeah. this case, a clone is just a line of code that is duplicated from another line of code, or is it? Yeah, it's or, like people do keep copy and paste and then paste it all over their code, and it's the same block of code, basically. That's what that means. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, when, when you do the metrics, it shows you the uh, blocks of um, clones and the lines of clones. I forgot what the blocks of uh, uh, clones were, but it totaled the 217,000 lines of duplicate code, yeah. Um, and that's always, always, always bad. Um, so another thing in my survey is how, and I don't believe this one either, 
um, how painful was it to take over somebody else's code? You know, I've been asking this question for a long time. And every time I ask it, most people go, oh my God, it was horrible. You know, that's usually the response I get. And uh, so I'm not sure if I believe these numbers, but but most people said it could have been better or very painful. Um, said Some said no problems at all, that's good. And some said it was okay. Uh, uh, it's the very painful and could have been better is, is what I'm striving for to fix. So here are some reasons we don't like taking over somebody's code. And I have a video, a link to this video at, at the end of the, the session, um, because I know what, why I don't like, you know, taking over somebody else's code, but I like to gather information from other people. So in, in this uh, this um, uh, class my friends did, um, the people in, in that class said, you know, the no XML commenting, which is one of my big pet peeves, no code commenting, which is another one, no self-documenting code. All three of those things are super, super important for documenting your code. And, and all three of those things I see not done very well usually. Um, coding stand, you know, lack of coding standards, magic numbers, bad names, bad formatting, all kinds of things. I, I could go on forever for that one. And as far as architecture and stuff goes, you know, large classes, um, global variables, um, tightly coupled code, improper scoping, broken code. I tell people all the time, do not leave broken code, do not leave commented out code in your code base. Get rid of it. That's what the repositories are for. Um, especially you know before you go to production. So there's lots of ways we don't like to take over somebody else's code. And and what's the first I say this when I have you know more people and and uh, um, and I'm live is you know um, what's the first thing you want to do when you would take over somebody else's code? Rewrite it, right? Because you don't understand it. So the easiest way to fix it is to rewrite it. And so we don't want that either because again, managers aren't going to give you the time to do that. So after selecting a standard, of course, uh, make it easily available to every programmer, either electronically or physically. Like one time uh, at a company where, you know, everybody got a copy of my book, I walked around and I go, so where's the copy of my book? And one person went in her drawer and there's a bunch of books on top of my book. And I go, no, 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 unless you're me, you need to have that book right next to you uh, so you can refer to it. So you need to make sure the standards are not only given to the developers, especially when they first start, like I, I have done, uh, I started a new job two weeks ago, uh, but then make sure it's easily available and keep it up to date, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, you also need to enforce it uh, because, you know, developers do whatever they want. And if you don't watch them, they're gonna write code any way they want. And um, especially contractors, because contractors are, you know, they're only for a limited time and they don't get reviews and stuff. So they don't care. Uh, so if you have contractors, this is even more important, but make sure you enforce it. Uh, uh, code reviews, pair programming, and there's other stuff I'm gonna talk about later too. Oh, this is the thing, must be included in the build process. There's analytic tools that I'll talk about in this session, and that must be part of your build. Again, because you know code reviews and all these other things, uh, the problem is the developer who doesn't wanna do it or doesn't do it, does it wrong. You need to use these tools to enforce these things are being done right before you release code to QA. Um, so make sure you do that. And I'm gonna talk about uh, the tools I use at least um, towards the end. And this kind of gets into what I just talked about, you know, how are uh, coding standards administered? Um, did I run this already? Oh, I showed this one already, didn't I? Administering? Oh, uh, maybe I've got a similar one. Yeah. Yeah. You showed a similar one. It wasn't that one. Okay. So my biggest thing was this is do something to make sure it's being done, including making it part of the build. Okay. That must always be part of the your continuous integration build. Okay. Come on, Kiss. One of my face first favorite groups. Um so uh you know, when I do this talk, I always talk, about, when I first started doing this talk, I was, I talked about there's two kinds of programmers and then I invented one. So I'm gonna go through them. Um, and this is kind of way I look at the different types of developers there are. There's more than three, but these are the three main ones to me. First one is complexifiers, right? Adverse to reduction and, and never likes to complete anything, right? I know I've known 
uh, developers like this. I've actually broken up with developers like this. I mean, left the contract because I just can't deal with people like this. Um, but you know, they're out there. And um, so uh, I, I try not, to, I'm not a complexifier by any stretch. Um, the one I made up was Prognant. Will not listen to anybody who thinks they know everything. <laughs> I know a lot of developers like that. Uh, so uh, avoid those and, and don't be one. So the develop, developer I try to do is a simple fire. I thrive on concision. I'd like to achieve what I, the goal is as easy as, I mean, to make it as easy as possible done because, you know, I write code 90% that anybody can look at it and knows, knows what it's doing, right? There might be some junior people I might have to show a couple things, but generally any code I write, I pride myself on making sure that anybody can understand it from a junior to a senior, right? Why? Because I like to architect code I don't like to maintain it, <laughs> right? And if, if if you are a complexifier, guess what's gonna happen? You're gonna have to maintain your own code. And that's what junior people are for. So if you make it really simple to understand, then you can give it to the junior people and you can move on to more fun things, right? So I do have a motive <laughs> of being a simplifier. It's because I don't wanna maintain code. I like to write it and move on to the next feature. Um, if your code is too complex or you think it might be too complex, um, if they're too big, overly complicated, then that's a big, uh, 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 you know, a big chance to do refactoring or rewriting, right? And um, refactoring is a skill that I don't think we really are taught, um, but it's in a very, very important part of uh, coding and uh, refactoring is definitely uh, something I do a lot. and. Um, I use um, Code Rust from um, Dev Express. I know there's um, ReSharper uh, out there too, a lot of people use, but, uh, and when I say refactoring, I don't mean the tools in Visual Studio, they're not very good. Um, you, you need to buy um, uh, uh, ReSharper or watch my show and get a free copy of Code Rush. And, uh, cause those are refactoring tools. Cause they really, I use Code Rush every day that I code and it, it's so much worth it. And, you know, since I've been doing this talks so long, you know, I remember one time a long time ago, someone came up to me and said, you know, so how much code is too much code, you know, in a method? And and my first answer was, well, if you can't see it all on a screen, it's too much, right? And uh, that's when screens were smaller. So I know we have big ass screens now, but um, definitely if, if it goes off, if you can't see the whole method in the screen, it's it's too big and it needs to be refactored. Um, and there's lots of tools like Code Rust that will help you identify where you need to do refactoring. Excuse um, me, David. Yeah. Are you saying Code Rust as in brown stuff that forms on metal or Code Rush as in oh, rush, rush into a building? Okay. Code Rush, R-U-S-H. Okay. Yeah. Um, so refactoring, of course, always code for reusability. I'm going to say this a million times during this um, session. Um, everything I code, I code as if it's going to be reused someday. Um, low cyclomatic complexity, okay? Um, I think this is where I talk about cyclomatic complexity. So you remember that, um, what, what, I had it here. Uh, at a cyclomatic complexity of um, what it uh, what, what was it? I forget. Had a huge cyclomatic complexity. Remember the number I told you? It was remember? over like thirty-eight thousand. Yeah, thirty-eight thousand, right? So if you have if you have a cyclomatic complexity of thirty-eight thousand, this is so cyclomatic complexity. If you don't want to means don't know what it means is it means it's the number of paths can be taken through the code depending on the variables that are coming in. And um, and you want to try to keep that number 20 or below if you're using a refactoring tool like Code Rush will show you what, what your cyclomatic complexity is. Um, but what that number really means to me is the minimum numbers, nim, eh, the minimum number of unit tests you need to write just to test encapsulation, right? So if you have a single project 
right? That has a cyclomatic complexity of 38,000. That means you should have close to 38,000 unit tests, right? This whole solution only has 9,000, right? So they're definitely not even close to the 75% code uh, coverage that Microsoft recommends. So um, that's what that number really means to me. And that's why refactoring is such an important skill to learn, especially doing it right. Um, also keep generics in mind. Whenever I write code, I try to make it as generic as possible. Even when I write methods, I go. I try to go down to the lowest interface that I can. So you know, it, uh, so I can, So some methods I might take I enumerable instead of I list, right? Because I enumerable be, can, can be used by multiple types, whereas I, you know, um, list can't. And um, so try to try to write everything as you can as much as you can in generics, and just ask somebody, you know, and you know the. The one thing that coding you all should know is that you know when you sit and stare at code for half an hour or, or an hour, you're the worst person to see what's going on, right? It's it's so easy for me to walk up to somebody's desk and go, oh yeah, that's the problem right there, you know. And so if you're stuck, just ask somebody. It's okay to ask. Pair programming can help, of course, um, to keep things simple, and of course, code review. Uh, we'll talk some more about that later, I think, too. So in my coding standards um, um, survey, I decided to ask, um, you know, what can be made, uh, what can be done to make code quality better? I mean, my whole book is, you know, basically what I, my answer is. Uh, but I, like I said, I'd like to to learn from other people all the time. And so here's what some other people say. I I I totally agree 1,000% with all these things. Unit test integration, unit test, unit test, unit test. Right? You've got to have unit tests to test your code. You know, one company I worked at um, and it was a four or five years ago. You know, it was a very small team. There's only two developers and two managers. And you know, one of the managers came up to me and when I first started and said, "Hey, Dave, we're going to give you admin uh, rights to, you know, AWS, so you can, you know, push code." And I said, "How many unit tests do you have?" And they said, "None." I go, "Don't give me, don't give me access. I won't do it. You know, because I'm not pushing bad code. I mean, I'm not pushing code I don't trust, right?" because I don't want to be here in the evening and I don't want to be here in the weekend, right? So you, Mr. Manager, if you want to push it, go for it, but I'm not doing it. <laughs> so uh, unit tests, uh, super important, of course. Training and team meetings. You have to constantly train on this stuff. You know, most places where I work, especially if I'm there in person, um, uh, the, my manager always has me do uh, brown bag lunches and things like that to keep people um, up to speed because I'm the coding standards king or whatever. And um, even at my last job, I think I did most of my conference sessions at work, you know, to teach the other junior, more junior developers there. So, um, you know, if, if, if you're into coding and, and you don't like to learn, you're in a wrong job. Uh, so, so I tell people all the time, code review, of course, can make uh, code quality better. Two I, you know, four eyes are, you know, usually a lot better than two. Code analytics, I use a lot of analytic tools. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about most of them today. Um, so use code analytics and developer culture of quality. You know, that's something I really see missing these days, which, which I hope to address on one of my upcoming shows, um, is the quality of code I'm seeing these days is just worse and worse. And it should be, I, I, the whole reason I wrote my book and do these talks is to make it better. And I don't see it going that way. So. Um, um, some more stuff. Um, come on. Care about our craft. This is another topic I want to address on my show. It's something else I don't see done as at least when I first started. Um, so I'd like to put out great programs. I like to, like at my last job, a Fortune 25 company, you know, they said I I architected and ran the best project in the company's history. You know, and I was going, well, wow, that's pretty cool. You know, you're a Fortune 25 company and my project was the best one. Come on, uh, that worries me. Uh, but care about your craft. I, I am, you know, the things I'm really proud of, I'm really proud of, you know, like being a patent, patent inventor. You know, I'm really proud of that project because um, I care about my craft. Keep learning and evolving. I just talked about learning. I tell, like I said, I tell people, if you if you don't like to learn, this is the wrong job for you. Um, no one's perfect. It, you know, it's okay to say you don't know. 
um, and ask for help. I mean, I'm not perfect by any stretch. Um, teach students uh, standards and architecture. <laughs> You know, and when I did teach at the, you know, I taught at the local university here for 18 years, and I drilled this into my beginner students' heads. Not all those teachers did it, but I did it, because this is what I really see missing from classes, is a teaching standards in architecture. Um, so, and coding standards, of course, uh, secure, robust, maintainable code, uh, which is what we're always trying to get get after. So, if you don't um, learn a derivation. Um, what are your patents in? Oh, you can look me up on Google Patent. I, I invented a ticketing uh, system for proflowers.com. Um, okay. For, for FedEx, yeah. Which allowed them to go to millions of dollars a day of sales, which they couldn't before what I wrote. And so um, that actually was patented after I left the company. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'm a patent inventor. My name is there. You can Google patent my name and I Google patent search my name and I only have one patent. So I'll probably be the only one I have. <laughs> so, okay. okay. Um, oh, go ahead. No, that, that's fine. I, I just said, okay. Okay. So let's talk about application setup. Um, so attention, uh, Visual Studio default project settings are not helpful for writing quality code, you know. I've, I've, I've been a Microsoft MVP for 15 years. And in the beginning, I really tried to get them to change this. I don't even try anymore because uh, they don't listen to me about this stuff. Uh, so it's up to us to make sure that we're diligent and, 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 and learn these kind of things. So um, the first thing, uh, I, 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 for a lot of reasons, maybe even a pet peeve, you know, take a little bit of time to name your assemblies, which you know, the base name of your assembly usually turns out to be the base name of your namespaces too. And in my book, it, it goes through a complete, you know, uh, exactly how you should name your DLLs and uh, which are your projects, but always put your company name first and then, you know, maybe the project and then keep going from there. And I'll show you some examples here in a second. Um, I, I don't see people doing this very much, unfortunately, but uh, if you look at most of the .NET assemblies, um, they all start with Microsoft or something like that, right? Um, and if you look at any assemblies from any other company, they always start with their company name. So you should do that too, even within your own company. It makes it just easy to tell where that, who that DLL is from. So here's some good names, you know, devexpress.pdf.core. I think I think that's a good name. Here's one of mine. Uh, I'll I'll be showing you this later. You know, my .tips.app.ads.dataaccess. Um, .tips.utility.core to Windows, which is part of my open source stuff. A Microsoft build utilities.core. See, all these kind of tell you exactly what it is just by looking at it, right? Um, so take a little time, you know, when you first start naming your stuff and make it consistent, you know, throughout your company or team. Um, here are some names I've seen recently that, um, uh, and some of these are from contracts I've worked on where I look at it, I go, what does this do, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, some project, you know, I, I had to take the project name off, dot web service API. Okay, web service API, what? What API is that? It tells me nothing. It's a web service API. Well, that's that's a framework. It's not a, <laughs> it's not a DLL, nor should it be your namespace, right? Um, I found this one today, F-S-A-B-L-L. What is that? I don't know, right? I can only guess. Um, common library. <laughs> common library for what? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, FTP download. What does it FTP? You know, uh, one company I, I worked at over 10 years ago, when I started at the company, um, you know, yeah, they use namespaces, but all of their namespaces through all their projects was classes. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. <laughs> Every namespace was the same. <laughs> oh, it took me a while to fix that. But um, so anyway, my big thing with that is just take some time and name it descriptive, just like we do with variables and classes and things like that. Um, you know, things have changed, you know, through all the 20 years I've been using .NET, but um, you know, your namespace and your assembly name start in the project properties, 
Um, I usually make them exactly the same. Um, in, in the case of my Spargene project, I do have a version number in the assembly name, but I don't have that in the namespace. So when I move to six, you know, people don't have to change namespaces all over the place. Um, so make sure you put that there. Um, sometimes Visual Studio will, will get those messed up. So the first thing I do when I start a project, I go there and I make sure that it's set up in there correctly. Um, and now with the later versions of .NET, it's really important to fill out everything in the package information um, tab, even though you might not be creating a NuGet package because a lot of this information is used um, in, in uh, naming your you know, description of your, your uh, DLL and things like that, right? They've moved it from one section to this section um, recently. So make sure you fill everything out, um, like the, uh, the author, the company, product description, copyright, um, project URL, all those things, version numbers, make sure you fill all those things out because it, it's really important um, for the internals of your um, DLL and your packages if you do those. Um, the other thing I always do, and uh, I'll tell you a story about this in a second, um, is the first thing I do is I go in and on, under build settings, I go to treat warnings as errors, and I do all, right? Because like I said earlier, uh, uh, a warning to me is a yellow light. That means about to turn red. So you might as well just fix it now and uh, so you don't have to worry about it later. So um, there have been, even recently, you know, I go in on a new project and usually whenever I start a new contract, the first thing I do is I go through all the projects and I change all the warnings uh, to errors. And then everybody yells at me. And in one, one place, somebody said, Dave, I had to turn it all off because it was too painful. It's making a build, build too long. And I go, good, right? It should be painful until you fix this stuff, right? Um, so do that. The other thing which is really important for documentation is to output XML documentation files for all of your DLLs, right? Because that can be used. I'll show you a video later. That can be used to create websites and things like that. So. Um, I always do that, which is not default. All the most everything I'm showing you here is not default in Visual Studio. So when you do treat warnings as errors, this is what happens: is that it, you know, basically turns all the warnings into errors, and you kind of have to fix those before you can complete the build. Uh, like I said, will be painful if you go do that to your projects tomorrow, but um, work through it uh, and get it all down to zero, uh, so you get no more errors anymore. But Errors are important to, I mean, warnings are important to, uh, to uh, worry about. Uh, suggestions slash messages is something you can worry about, but the warnings and errors you should always take care of, to me. Um, this is something else I never see anybody do, is digitally sign your assembly. So when you, when you version, when you put a version number in a DLL, I mean, in a assembly in .NET, that's not the version number. Right, that's the file version number, right? Um, to to complete to create a uniquely uh, versioned uh, uh, assembly in .NET, you have to sign it, right? Because that's the only way you can guarantee uniqueness of that assembly is by digitally signing it. So again, you should be doing this. Um, I'll give you the biggest reason to do this in a second. Uh, uh, part of the, the benefits is it's easy to put stuff in a global assembly cache, which most people don't do anymore. But if you if you want to put something in a global assembly cache, like all the .NET DLLs are, uh, you have to digitally sign it. Um, the biggest reason, and I won't tell you the story in this talk, but the biggest reason is this, spoofing, right? Um, you know, anybody can reverse engineer your, your DLL, right? And um, and if you don't digitally sign it, that means it can be spoofed, meaning somebody can place a DLL that's just that's named just like yours on your server and send information to themselves. So uh, you need, and that's the first thing I do with every company I go to is like, oh, are you signing your assemblies? Because oh, they go, oh, it's okay, you know, uh, all of our stuff is on servers. Well, how about those get hacked into, <laughs> right? <laughs> you, you're opening yourself up to hacking if you don't digitally sign your uh, DLLs. And so the only way to do a uniquely, you know, so a unique assembly in .NET that can't be spoofed unless you have a supercomputer is to digitally sign them. So um, in .NET, it's super easy. There's really a pattern of doing this, but it's super easy. You just go 
uh, to the click uh, to the publish tab and there's a sign assembly. You can create a, a key file if you don't have one, which will have a password in it. And that's it pretty much. And if, if you have a company, you pretty much should only have one key, right? You don't want too many of these because again, um, and you have to keep these very secure. Uh, and like what I mean by not put them in the repository because if anybody gets a hold of that key, uh, they can spoof your assembly. So you have to be very careful who has the key and uh, when you use it. So again, there's a whole pattern uh, for that. You can go look it up on how you do that, but it's super important to do that. Um, so anyway, that's my thing about digital signing. So code analysis. Um, so um, the other thing that's not set up uh, by default correctly in Visual Studio is code analysis. And I get on them all the time. If you follow me, Twitter, I'm always getting on them about this. And so um, the current way you do that is go to code analysis tab and you click run on build, uh, at least have run on build set. And then I have some experimental stuff on the bottom set that I'm, I'm playing around with. But you want to run the code analysis every time you build because you want to fix those errors right away because it's, it's a lot harder to fix problems uh, days or weeks or months later. So if you just, if you just turn run on build, uh, it'll create build errors if you're doing such stuff wrong and make you fix it right away. So make sure you do that. Again, this is not default. And this is something else people turn off behind my back because it makes things too slow for them. Um, and the violations will appear. I said that about uh, when it builds. Of course, fix these as soon as possible. Like I said, the cost of fixing things right when you see them is so much cheaper than the cost of fixing things later down the road. That cost later down the road can be 100 times or more the cost to fix the same thing if you just fixed it when you were coding it. Um, the, the new way of doing um, a, a, analytics in, in, in Visual Studio, which I'm not a big fan of, is using the editor config file. Um, Microsoft used to use FX Cop, and now they moved away from that, and they're using these, um, um, uh, what do they call them? Um, uh, uh, I'm forgetting the name of them. There's a couple that automatically load whenever you create a project. Um, analyzers, they, um, they have all these analyzers now, and all those analyzers are basically controlled through the editor config. I'll show you a, a sample in a sec. And I've actually been working on my, my new editor config, which is about, it's twice as big as uh, my old one. And, um, and that allows you to set you know, things up as warnings or errors or turn them off or you know, make them only turn on with certain types and lots of other things like that. So um, unfortunately, this experience in Visual Studio is not good. I, I'm gonna work on uh, with them about this, but anyway, um, and I'm not going to teach you about editor config in this because I don't have the time. It's a whole talk in and of itself. But this is what an editor config looks like. If you know what an INI file is, then that's what an editor config is. It's just the <laughs> bringing back the INI files from the 90s. Um, and uh, and you can see here, you can set up you know the size of your tabs and what kind of intenting style. But the most important things are down below, where it has all the naming, you know the uh, naming symbols and naming rules and things like that. Again, I'm not a big fan of the way they did this and I hope I can work with them to make this easier. If you wanna see what my my public editor config looks like, you can go to that uh, URL and download um, my latest public one. Again, I'm working on a brand new one, which is at least twice as big as this one. Uh, I've tried to scour the internet and find every one of these settings because no one seems to have them. Um, other project setup suggestions. Um, something I like to do because I, I do a lot of NuGet packages now is it, this makes it really easy for me to do testing and benchmarking is I have a common folder on my C drive where I, I write a post event um, uh, during release builds and that moves, uh, I've written about this on my website and that moves the, uh, the package to a common folder that makes it really easy for me to set up in the package or config section. In the, in the package manager. So um, I do that. It makes it really easy for me to test my NuGet packages. Um, every string and graphic or video you have should be in a resource file. Again, this is for globalization and localization. Um, any string you show the user 
uh, uh, should be in a resource file, except, of course, unless it's coming from a database or something like that. Um, done at core and done at five, got rid of the project settings uh, feature um, that the, the CLR uh, .NET framework that had. Unfortunately, I'm trying to get them to get bring this back, but um, it just made it really easy to do um, application settings. So when .NET Core first came out, I basically kind of created something very similar called the config.c as my open source project. So you can go check that out if you want. All right. Not many people, so any, any questions so far? No, I appreciate it. This is great stuff. Okay. I'll Some keep of it going. I'm very familiar with, and uh, you know, it's but other things, it's kind of nice tips. So I appreciate it. Yeah. So if you want to explain anything anymore, please do, because uh, like there's only five people. So, um, so these are issues I see all the time, and you know, when I was uh, when I was revamping this talk for this um, uh, meeting. Uh, I was going through these issues and going, I see this in the code base, I'm looking at that right now. <laughs> so unfortunately, I keep seeing these things. Um, one of the things I talk about in my defensive programming talk and in my defensive programming section in my Coding Insiders book is doing everything you can to prevent exceptions from happening. Because exceptions are really bad, They're, they, they really kill your performance, and there's lots of ways you can do um, to get around that problem. So here's one of the typical ones I see all the time is um, is uh, doing convert to date time and giving it some kind of string, right? That can cause an exception, guaranteed, okay? So you don't want to cause an exception, right? Because then that will kill your performance. So um, later in, dot, we didn't have this in the beginning of .NET, but Later in .NET, at least, I, I know they did this for all the um, um, value types in .NET, but all value types in .NET now have, because of this problem, have a method called uh, triparse, right? So in triparse, you can give it a bad string, but what that does, and instead of causing exception, it just returns a false, right? So this is a lot better way of converting an all uh, you know, framework, uh, all the uh, reference types in .NET have this triparse. And so if you create your own kind of reference type, uh, not reference types, uh, value types in .NET, if you create your own value types, you should also do a triparse for your uh, structure and things like that. So um, always, always use triparse. Don't use parse anymore. Um, I was kind of hoping when they went to .NET 5 and 6, they'd remove that stuff, but I guess that would that would break too many too many people's code. Um, so I think this is one where I'm going to ask you a question. This is kind of a hard one, even for me to look at and see if there's three there's three code problems in this code. I'm going to give you like a minute, 30 seconds to see if you can see what those are. The only and the clue is they're all around the is exception. That real code. Is this, this is, real? I told you I don't show fake code. I only show real code. This is real code. <laughs> you can catch something. You can for that very last line and the line <laughs> above it. You can just catch without like specifying what the exception is. Well, I'll I'll, I'll go over that last line in a second. So yeah, the last line is a problem. Or anybody else know what the other two problems are? Well, you're throwing in the second one, they're throwing an exception. Well, if you're handling it, then why do you need to throw? I guess there is a right reason to throw it if you really want, want it to bubble up. Yeah, but, exactly. Exactly. So you, you pretty much got all three of them. Uh, the, the third one, you're, you're right there. So yeah, uh, the problem is, is it, you know, they're catching data exception. And then they're throwing a new data exception. I don't know what they're thinking, you know. Um, and then I'll talk about this in a second. They're throwing EX if it gets down there, right? But the worst thing is the last line because if you throw an exception in the first catch, it's going to catch in the third one in the last line. So this whole thing is ah, oh, supposedly written by a senior software engineer. Um, so. 
Yeah, this hey, is Dave. all bad. Yeah. One additional comment. Um, so other than it's bad, <laughs> the fact that you're throwing a data exception, and then when you catch it, you're throwing that exception again, but then the last clause for catch, basically you're catching all the exceptions, but now you're throwing a different data exception, all, or uh, excuse me, a different exception altogether. Yeah. Yeah. So yes. <laughs> yes, you are throwing an exception at the end, but it's a different type and you're kind of hiding the error yeah. or the exception, I should say. You're definitely hiding the error. This whole thing is, I couldn't believe it when I saw it. You know, I was going, oh my God. <laughs> I also wanted to comment, um, another issue that I ran into with uh, something like this is, and it was done by another senior developer, where basically he was putting in template code and it was, uh, he was putting in the try catch blocks, but in the catch blocks, he wasn't doing anything. Yeah. So in yeah, essence, you were silencing the exception. And so yes. you're you swallowing leave it to the, the user exception. to find that error. Yeah, you're swallowing the exception. You should never do that, ever. You should never right. have an empty catch block. Um, you'll never see that in my code. <laughs> Even if I'm just printing out a trace, there's something there, right? Because um, if, if you hide stuff, then there's no way you can fix it or know how to fix it. So this whole thing is bad. And I'm gonna kind of go over some, the right way of doing things. So um, always add the caught exception as the inner exception if you're going to throw an exception, right? If you're gonna create a new exception in, an, in, in a catch block that makes sure you put the, the original exception in the inner exception, right? Um, because the number one thing of ex exception is the call stack, right? Because we all know most of the messages or it don't you doesn't tell you anything, right? It's really the call stack is what you want. Um, so what they were doing before is they were losing the call stack. Um, so if you do throw a data exception like those guys did, make sure you put the original exception in it. You know the the code above would have been, you know, a tiny bit better if he did that when he re rethrew the same exception, but it was still would have been bad, right? Uh, but yeah. But yeah, so yeah, always have an inner exception if if this is being because you're catching something. Um, and like I said, you never. I wish they would remove this from .NET. You never throw ex ever, right? Because if you do that, you're losing the call stack, right? And the call, like I said, the call stack is the most important thing. And uh, so never do that. If you're going to rethrow an exception, you just do throw, right? Because if you just do throw, everything is kept and the call stack is kept and everything is good, okay? Never do throw EX. And the la analytic tools that you know I'm gonna talk about all catch this. Um, so it's an easy way to, to find these problems in your code. Um, Here's another one, even in the code base I'm, I'm working on right now. Uh, this is uh, one of Microsoft's design guidelines. Do not raise uh, res reserved exception types. So there's there's about five exception types in .NET that you're not supposed to throw under any circumstances, right? They're, they're only for the .NET framework. They're not for you, right? Um, one of them is exception. I actually did a code review yesterday as somebody on my team and said, and they were throwing exception. I go, no, you don't throw exception ever, ever, ever. Okay. Um, application exception, system exception. There's a couple other ones, but the biggest, the biggest ones I see people do are exception the application exception. Um, don't do that. Um, so, what I typically do when I'm going to throw an exception is number one, I first look using the object. Um, browser, an object viewer in Visual Studio, which is dog slow. But if you just type in the word exception, it will show you all the exceptions in all the frameworks and pick one from there if it suits your needs. So if it doesn't suit your needs and create your own custom exception by inheriting exception, right? And like create customer, uh, uh, create customer exception. That's, that's a bogus one I created, but you know, you can inherit exception and create your own exceptions, right? Don't use the reserved ones. And I have a whole uh, 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 thing on my website uh, about Ask.NET Dave about properly throwing exceptions if you want to read that later. Um, so here's another. <laughs> this is this is another one I've never seen in my life. 
uh, but I like to show because I'd, I'd like to see if people can really see the issue in this. So um, there's not much line, much lines of code in this. So uh, what's the problem in this code? And the hint's going to come up here in like five seconds. This one's tough, um, but the biggest thing, and uh, I'll, uh, I don't know if I'll tell you this story later, but uh, the biggest thing was this code when I found it, and I was found this code was causing, every time I sent an order into it, it was causing 300 exceptions. And part of my investigation of that, um, I found this, and this was the culprit. The problem with this code right here as you can see, the you know the class is called order event, right? And the constructor, you know, it takes in a, a customer, takes in an order, and then calls process order underneath it, right? I'm gonna pound this into your heads. Never call code from a constructor. Never call methods or properties or anything like that from a constructor ever, right? And this is where I learned my lesson because. If an exception happens in the constructor, in the constructor, it's almost literally impossible to trap. And your program just won't go down, it will poof go away. Because <laughs> I've seen this happen, okay? So, and I'll tell you what you do in constructors, but you don't do this, right? So the story with what happened with this was, I found out that they weren't disposing um, some of their fields which is very, very common in most of the code that I see. And so as soon as I added iDisposable to this class and the proper dispose method down below, whenever I ran unit tests against this, the unit test program would poof, go away, right? Because what was happening was things were being disposed while the object was being created. <laughs> So I know this is an edge case. I've never seen, well, I can't say I've never seen anybody do this before, but this was the worst case. But my whole thing is you never call methods from a constructor. The only thing you do in a constructor is set variables because that won't cause an exception, right? You don't want to cause an exception in a constructor. Bad, bad, bad. Okay. So only set field or property values. Uh, do not call methods, properties, or create objects from the constructor. Okay. Don't do any anything that can cause an exception, you don't do from the constructor. Okay. Which is pretty much everything. <laughs> okay. Do it somewhere else. If you have to admit the class somewhere, then create a method and do it that way. You don't do any work like that in a constructor. Okay. Believe me, it might sound weird, but it will save you later from being called on the weekend and coming into work and fixing something. All right, so I'm not going to stop for questions since there's only five of us. Um, so write better types. So this is my my part. You know, after I gave this talk for a while, I decided that I kind of need to go back to, you know, my beginner days of learning the proper way of um, um, writing types. And because I, I see too many people even now not doing this even close to uh, uh, correct, at least correct in my book. So I'm going to explain all three of these things, but here are .NET Dave's top three rules. And most of these rules I've been using since I've been a programmer. Um, first is all assemblies must be dumb and stupid. And what I mean by dumb and stupid, I mean reusable assemblies. Most everything in this section, I'm talking about reusable assemblies, not um, applications, okay? So reusable assemblies must be dumb and stupid. I'll explain that. Um, they must implement data and logic encapsulation, right? And this is what I have yet to see any project do properly that I work on. I don't even see people doing encapsulation correctly. And what I usually say is, if I don't see you doing encapsulation correctly, I have very little hope you're doing abstraction, polymorphism, or inheritance correctly, okay? 
Uh, if you can't get the first easiest thing in, pro in object-oriented programming correct, I, I have no hope for you, okay? And, and when I do this in person, I ask everybody, how many people here do object-oriented programming? Most everybody raises their hand. By the end of this section, uh, you won't think you're doing it anymore, okay? Um, and reuse, reuse, and more reuse. I have an article named that on my website if you want to go read it. Um, I, like I said before, almost every line of code I wrote, write, that's, it will be reused by some other code someday, right? And if you do that now, it'll save you tons of time and money later uh, because this will happen, I guarantee it. Um, so my first biggest thing, and I've been doing this talk for 11 years, and it, and I tell people in conferences all the time that if I just saw all programmers doing caps and caps encapsulating correctly, I would promise to quit speaking. <laughs> But it's 11 years now, or no, it's been 16 years I've been doing this talk. It's been 16 years, and I still don't see it done right, even today. Um, so all data coming into the type uh, through methods and properties must be validated. Or you're not doing encapsulation, therefore you're not doing object-oriented programming. Okay, So that's when everybody's hands goes down, because no one gets this correct, pretty much. So. Is this a dumb and stupid constructor? So if you remember what I said about being dumb and stupid is, um, well, I'm gonna actually explain this in a second, but this constructor, not only is there's too much stuff going on in here, uh, but it's not dumb and stupid. And the reason it's not dumb and stupid is because these two calls right here, config path and config output message to console is coming from some global type in the project right? Wrong. <laughs> you don't do that. You pass in these values. You don't get it from some global type. Global is gone in .NET. You don't do global anymore, pretty much, unless you're doing dependency injection, right? Uh, other, other than that, you don't do global variables anymore. Um, and this, is this dumb and stupid? No, this isn't dumb and stupid, because uh, the other thing I'm going to talk about is not only is it catching exception, which you never do in DLLs, okay? I'll, I'll talk about that briefly in a second, but it's logging. You never log in DLLs, okay? Uh, you you let application log or you use dependency injection and use that, but you never log directly from an, a DLL. Why? Because now you're tightly coupling the logging system to your DLL, and this happened to me. so. I was working at a company and they said, hey, Dave, we heard you create, you uh, you know, created this cool DLL, can we reuse it? And I'll go, yeah, sure. And they said, well, what logging system do you use? And I tell them, well, we don't use that logging system. And I go, well, you're screwed then, aren't you? You know, and that's not good. That's tightly coupling your code to a logging system and you should not, code should not be tied to any logging system, right? And luckily in the later versions of .NET Core and .NET 5, you know, with the, um, uh, they've added iLogger, which allows us to do that now, which we haven't been able to do before done at core. Um, so every logging system uses iLogger now, including NUnit and all the major logging systems. So that's the only thing you should be using in your assembly. So you can easily swap that stuff out. So any knowledge the class needs must be provided like database connection strings, file names, paths, anything that that class needs to operate correctly, okay? And something I've been doing since the 90s is usually, I won't say I do this all the time, but 90 plus percent of the time, the only parameters in a constructor I create it is something that type has to have to work, like a database connection string or a file path or something like that, right? Otherwise, I don't put it in a constructor. And especially now that we have the object initializers, we don't need to do that anymore. Back in the early days of .NET before object initializers, we did create a lot of overloaded constructors to make things easier on us. But now with object initializers, we don't need that anymore. So don't do it, okay? I've never done it anyway. Um, uh, but um, so anything the class needs must be provided to it. It should not know anything about its outside world. Um, 
and DLL should never log exceptions, right? Unless you're using the new iLogger stuff or email them. <laughs> I've seen this in DLLs too, where they actually email exceptions in the DLL. I'm going, oh, what are you doing? No, don't do that. That's the job of the application, okay? Um, so if I could change this code, which I couldn't because they wouldn't give me the code. So if I took these people's code, this is what I would do is I would just put these two connection strings in the constructor because they're required for this uh, a database type you know, to get the low data and stuff. And then, of course, the other thing I, I briefly said, but I'll say it again, is um, you should never ever catch the exception type in DLLs, okay? The only exceptions you should be uh, catching in DLLs are something like SQL exception, or you know, unauthorized exceptions, things like that. You should never catch the exception type itself, right? Because it's too generic and doesn't really tell you much of anything. Okay. So um, if if I could, I know a lot of people like to catch exception as a catch-all, right? You don't do that. You want the exception to bubble up to the caller to the next caller, to the next caller, because the final caller will be the application and that's where you log your email things, okay? Not in DLL, okay? So just let things bubble up. I think someone said that already. Um, so encapsulation, I, I, again, this is something I don't see done pretty much anywhere I go, I go work properly. Uh, prevents the setting of internal data to an invalid state. You know, the whole thing with object-oriented programming the first pillar of object-oriented programming is encapsulation. That's data hiding. And if you're not hiding your data within your type, you're exposing yourself to a lot of problems, right? Um, including corruption. And um, But mainly what I'm talking about here are causing exceptions and things like that. Um, so reduce complexity, of course. Limit interdependencies, reuse, reuse, reuse. I'm gonna say that over again, over and over again. So when you're thinking about encapsulation, you know, group properties, methods, and other things into a single type and purpose, right? If if I have a type called print PDF, that's all that should do. It should not save PDFs. It should only print PDFs, right? And in .NET, you know, there's no limit to the number of classes so you can create. So you don't need to create just one big class with everything in it, okay? It's okay to create little ones with little things in it. And, and that also makes it much, much easier to unit test, right? Um, all interactions with the type, with the data within the type must be done through properties methods. That's it, okay? No fields, no other way. Properties and methods should be the only way to get the data. Fields should be illegal in .NET. I mean, public fields. Um, and of course, data validation is key. And when I go look at a new code base, like I'm doing now, um, the first thing I do is I, when I go to methods, I look and see what the top of the method. And if there's no validation, they're not doing encapsulation. So here's here's some code that I wrote for actually the medical department uh, at the university I used to work at. And, 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 and the reason I'm showing this is because, you know, encapsulation means more than just encapsulating, encapsulating data. It's, it's encapsulating uh, uh, business logic and things like that too, right? And that's something a lot of people forget about when they think about encapsulation. It's not just the data, it's the inner workings of that type and what it does should be encapsulated too. And I'll, I'll go over that, I think, in the next slide. So um, this is example, I have to change the types and names and everything so I don't get sued. So, um, so here I have a public sealed class. Most classes should all be sealed. If you're not, if you, if you uh, create a class that uh, uh, is not mentioned in it, the inherited seal it because that actually helps the performance a tiny little bit, and you and you want to you want all the performance gains you can, especially now with the cloud. So public sealed order collection and I inherit list of order. Okay, easy. Um, so the first thing I did with this because I knew when I left this project, you know, the people on that that were going to be left there were like junior programmers, and I wanted to make things as easy as possible on them. Um, and that's why I did stuff like this. And I still, I, I have always done this. So I created a public static um, 
method called create, which returns back an order collection, the, the same type that I'm in, right? Um, and the reason I do this is because I want to encapsulate the business logic on creating an order collection, right? And uh, just sticking items into it might not be, is usually not the way to go. It's, it's some, something has to be done. Even if you're just making sure that there's actually something in uh, uh, that collection, uh, which is validate, try validate param. You'll see a couple times it's from my open source project. So first I make sure that orders is not null and then I make sure there's actually something in orders, which that method does. Then if it passes that, um, then I create a new order collection and then I'd use for each. And then I add into my order collection um, everything that's not null, right? Because the one thing I always try to guard against is that you don't want null items in your collection, right? So most all code I write is all it does checks for null because I don't want nulls in my code because that can cause exceptions because you don't think that'll happen and it does. Um, so if it's not null, then I add it. Add if uh, not exist is a, a something from my open source project. Um, and then I return that collection. So that's the only way to create an order collection is to actually use the static method, okay? Um, if you have a collection of orders already. So the next part of the code is adding uh, adding something to an order, uh, to the order collection. So here I have add, I take in uh, order, and the first thing again is I make sure it's not null, and I make sure the underlying uh, a uh, list does not already contain that order, right? Because I don't want to put it in twice. So this is kind of my guard clause to make sure the same order isn't put in the uh, collection twice. And so if it passes that, um, then I add the order, okay? And depending on the class, I would throw events here too to let somebody know that something was added. Hey, now the next thing, kind of a random thing, are you literally checking to see if the exact same object is in the order list yeah. or if, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. So there's no comparison logic that you're using for that to Well, like... it, this is using, this is just using normal comparison logic. You okay. can add, write your own comparison logic using uh, on compares, uh, but this is just using the normal, yeah. Um, look at all the values in the object kind of comparison thing, yeah. Um, all right. There's other ways to do that, but this is the easiest one. So then, yeah, I add it to the order. Now, the other thing I wanted to talk about, because uh, something must have been going on when I wrote this code way back, uh, back then, is again, I don't want a junior programmer to have to understand what makes an open order, right? Because depending on the project I've been on, right, um, you know, that could mean a certain flag is set in a database and all these kind of weird things. And you don't want a junior programmer or somebody new to the team to have to figure that out, right? Because that's really the job of the architect. He should figure that out, he or she should figure that out and write that into the type. It's my whole point. So the, the person using this type should not know what makes an open order. All they do is they call open orders and this does the logic and returns back only the open orders, okay? so. The reason I bring that up again is because, you know, encapsulation means more than data. It actually means encapsulating the business logic, validation logic, things like that uh, in the type, okay? Again, because you don't want junior develop, you don't have to handhold junior developers uh, to, to show them like example, this flag, this flag, this flag means it's an open order, right? It's, it's, it's to me, it's a, you don't need to waste that time. So the next thing I want to talk about is reuse, reuse, and more reuse. Like I said, I have an article named that on my website. Um, you should always code for reuse. And the, and the number I tell people in conference talks is 90% of your code should not be in the EXE or the website, okay? It should all be in reusable DLLs. That should be the number you should strive for. And that's the number I always do, if not more, is 90%, right? The only code in, in, in uh, executables and websites should be just to deal with the users and show them data and, and process data to the backend system. That's it. Everything should be in DLLs because it makes them more reusable. And you know, I'll, I'll share a story of like one of the first times this happened to me way back in the 90s. I, the reason I live where I currently do 
about a mile from the beaches because I used to work like three blocks from here. And, um, and you know, my boss had me write a website and I asked him, I go, so is this always gonna be a website? He goes, yeah, I go, okay. So I wrote everything, you know, I wrote this website, everything. And then one day he goes, oh, Dave, now we have to support a mobile blah, 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 you know? And, I, and he goes, well, how hard is that gonna be? And I go, well, now I have to rip all the code out <laughs> and put it into a DLL, which I should have done in the first place. And then you can reuse it in the seller application for a mobile device or iPhone or something like that, right? So that's what I learned my lesson early in, in my career. And uh, and yeah, you should always always put most of the stuff in, in DLLs. I know I'm running long, I'm sorry. I'm gonna try to speed it up. Um, refactoring is, is key to this. Um, I already talked about using generics. Use design patterns, but don't design yourself into a hole. I've seen that too. Uh, people use design patterns too much sometimes. Um, so be careful about that. And use existing frameworks, right? I, I don't know how many companies I go into and they, they think they can they can invent things themselves that have already been invented, like NED framework. I, I have a long story about that at a company I worked at. Um, that they thought they could write any framework better than Microsoft and which of course completely failed, you know? Uh, so the first thing I do when anybody comes to me or when I am trying to solve something is I look and see if someone has already solved it before and go buy it, right? Or go steal it from the open source project or something like that, right? I, I, I never try to write things unless I find out it hasn't been written before, okay? So super important in my book. Uh, always code for usability. Um, so also assembly documentation. I, I'm going to blow through this because I'm I'm running short on time already, and um, uh, so I'm not going to show you the video. But um, so one thing, I, if you look at my open source project, everything is documented, right? Not only because I'm really big in the documentation. Uh, but XML comments can be turned into websites and help files and things like that. So if you properly do XML commenting, which this video shows, so I'm not going to go through today, um, then it, it basically, if you use proper coding standards, go stock from submain, which I've used forever, will basically write the documentation for you if you use proper coding standards. Check it out. It's free. Um, I swear by it. I never check in code unless I... I have the whole class documented first, except for test classes, I don't care about them. But every other class is documented. And go look at my open source. It's uh, uh, I, I practice what I preach. And documentation is an important part of Agile. So if you're not documenting, you're, you're not doing Agile correctly. So I'm really big into documentation, but um, like I said, I'm running out of time for that. Um, some more suggestions, uh, limit, uh, nested in, in loop statements. Um, always fill out the default uh, switch and select case statements. Um, so it's something I was looking at today even that people don't do a lot. Um, so I always like to show examples and I like to show things like I've done to show you that I do what I'm telling you. And uh, so this is, uh, you can go read the whole series on my website. I wrote a whole series of uh, uh, writing a cloud app from from beginning to end. I think it's like five articles, and uh, this is that. Um, this is the architecture from those articles, and um, I'll explain. So this is this is um, all this stuff is being used by an exe that I wrote a long time, not a long time ago, but a while ago. So I always use n tier ish um, architecture, no matter what type of uh, program I'm doing, and even a simple program as this, I still use it. Um, because it, there's so many great um, things about um, N-tier or multi-tier or whatever they call it nowadays. So th the base tier always, of course, is the database tier. You got to get your data from somewhere. And in this case, I'm using Cosmos DB in my data layer, and I have a DLL called .netips.app.ads.dataaccess.dll. So that's my data access. That's all it does is data access. That's it. No models, no nothing. It's just the data access part, right? Um, on top of that, I have my models, which I put in my business layer that's in the uh, tips.app.ads.entities. Um, and then I also have a microservice, uh, which is fired off of a service bus queue um, in Azure. Top of that, 
all programs pretty much have to have a communications layer. So this is my communications layer where I have a cloud access DLL, which you'll see how that's used in a second. Uh, but mainly the API um, itself to get the data out to the program is through the .NET tips .add, uh, apps .add, uh, adds .api. Um, and then my user experience, which is just used by me as uh, Blazor, and uh, that's my Blazor DLL. Um, but all this is being basically used by this app over here, which is my backup and cleaner app uh, that I've had around for a while for .NET developers that cleans all the cast and and stuff that Visual Studio leaves laying around on your hard disk and um, also makes it really easy to back up code uh, before, uh, because I've yet to find a source control program that doesn't clobber my code. So before I even touch a source control program, I make a backup using my program. And that's what that, this program does. Um, I'm working on a new version. If you want to be a, 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 a beta tester of it, please let me know. I'm looking for people to help me test it. Um, and my next goal for that app is I'm going to turn it. I'm going to uh, convert it into uh, .NET MAUI as soon as uh, the next release comes out. Um, so on top of that, this is how the application is even segmented out. Um, so here's my app, um, and on top of that, all, all the processing that this app does is through the uh, .NET Dev Utility Processors DLL. Um, and then I have a common a dev common one, which is used throughout all these uh, different apps I might write. And then I have the all the UI uh, reusable UI pieces, the buttons, the you know the boxes, all that stuff is in the uh, dev UI DLL, so I can reuse those in other apps. Um, and then um, the cloud access DLL from the other uh, slide is used to send things up uh, to the cloud, back and forth to the cloud. And then I use my own open source projects. Uh, NuGet packages there. Those are all the ones I use in all my apps. Um, so that's even how I, then this is a simple program. It only does two things, right? But I still architect it like any other app. I don't change my architecture because of the app. Um, so the last section, uh, the last big section is, uh, oops, this is the next to last big section. Uh, the last section is, is the apps I used to to figure all this stuff out. So only so uh, exception trapping and reusable DLLs, I kind of talked about that. Only trap exceptions you can do something with. Otherwise, let them bubble up to the caller. Um, this is an example of that, um, where I'm catching a SQL exception. I close the connection, and then I throw an activation exception, because uh, that's what I decided to do then. Um, in applications and websites, you can catch exception. Uh, which means you have to put try catch everywhere uh, because you need to log all the exceptions you have and also change program flow. It's very, very important for applications. Um, so uh, you can catch exception applications, uh, but not in DLLs. Okay? There's two different patterns of doing it. Um, but try not to use exception if you can get away with it. Uh, something I like to do in, in any classes I create is making them easier to, to debug because I have to debug things. So most of the time, like when you're debugging like a collection.net and you and you look at it through the viewer, this is what you see, right? I, that doesn't tell me anything, right? It tells me the object names, you know, which is useless. So what I always do is I put, I use debugger display attribute. And now when someone's looking at my collection, they can actually see values. Right, and so it's pretty. It's really easy to set up with the uh, debugger display. So make things easier on the people that are using your code, because like I said, 90 per plus percent should be reusable. So you have to think about someone's going to reuse it someday. So make it easy on them, because you're a programmer too. Um, other things keep in mind: globalization. I I don't have time to talk about it in this talk, uh, but learn globalization, code for globalization all the time using resource files. Um, Make sure to unit test your stuff. Um, unit testing, you know, we didn't really have unit testing in my beginner days. Now we do, so use it. 75% um, of your code should be covered by unit tests, if not more. Um, at least all the public stuff should be unit tested. Um, and perform diagnostics and testing, which I talk a little bit more about in my uh, performance talk. Um, other things to keep in mind, keep up with technology. Our world changes every day, so we have to constantly learn. 
you know, I see developers on Twitter all the time. Why do I have to learn outside of work? Oh, because work's not going to give you the time to learn it. Uh, that's, that's the way it is. Um, uh, if you don't have, I think one of my friends said this, if you don't have time to keep your code clean, you're trying to do too much, reduce your velocity. Uh, this, my friend who invented mob programming, uh, I think said that to me one day. And of course, readability, you have to change. Sometimes you do things because it makes it easier to read. Oh, and one more thing. Uh, don't deviate from your coding standards unless you all decide on it and it's documented. Just don't deviate because you feel like it. Because now you're breaking the, the coding standards. It's going to make it harder on everybody else. Um, so, And one thing I, I, I say a lot is uh, uh, perception is everything. Right, and uh, I, I, especially as a as a contractor, I try to make I not only do all these things, but it's important for me to leave code behind that it's easy to understand, it's clean, it's it's really easy to use, and uh, most everybody I work with say says that about my code. So, and especially as a contractor, I don't want people going, oh well, that sucky code that Dave McCarter wrote. Glad he's gone. You know, I I don't want people saying that. So. Uh, so perception is everything to your users, of course, who pay for your stuff, to your boss, and of course me, because uh, if I'm, if you have me come look at your code, it better look good. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to be talking about it on some future talk. <laughs> Actually, I have this done that Dave says because one time I was in an interview, and and they they said, are are you going to blog about us? During the interview, I should have known I shouldn't have worked there. <laughs> so here's my minimum workflow I do before I check in every any code. And like I said, there's actually more things to this workflow, but this is the minimum I do. And that keeps me from, I mean, that always makes sure I have good looking code and perception is great. First, I code using uh, coding standards and refactoring, of course. Then I document the code using GoStock or code comments, uh, both. Um, then I check for issues. And again, I don't have a lot of time to get it. I, I can't get into it on this talk. But if you're using .NET Framework, you could use Code It Right. And uh, no matter what version of .NET you're using, you can use Visual Studio Analyze to analyze your code. Um, I talked a little bit about in the beginning of this talk about the editor config file. Uh, watch my website because I'm going to write a I'm planning on writing a big article about that because um, it's 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 pretty difficult to to, to get through. I mean, Microsoft did not make that easy on us, so I'm going to write a whole article. So to watch for that. Then I run my unit tests. Then I commit my code. So this is my work, my minimum workflow I do before I check in anything. Okay. There's a couple more steps I say, like I said, that I I do like uh, uh, benchmarking. I also do. Um, um, memory profiling, right? I don't see anybody do pretty much. I do that, but uh, that's that's part of a bigger workflow. This is my minimum every day that I work. And one thing I say is, you know, if your code is hard to unit test, you're doing it wrong, right? Your code should be super, super easy to unit test. And if you follow the things that, some of the things I've said in this talk, but, but especially in my book, it'll make it a lot easier to unit test your code. Okay, so whenever you're architecting things now, make sure you think about unit testing. It's how hard that's going to be to unit test. And that's why I put everything in reusable DLLs. It's easy to unit test DLLs. It's not easy to unit test applications and, and websites. So um, another reason just to use DLLs. Okay, Encore, almost done. Sorry, I'm, I'm a little uh, over time. You know, one thing because I practice and preach this stuff all the time is, you know, I try to tell people code quality is a feature. <laughs> you know, I don't think people really realize that, you know, it's, it is a feature. And um, the problem is management doesn't care. You know, I, I've yet to have a manager that really cared about code quality. What do managers care about? Shipping product, right? And money. They don't care about the quality, right? And uh, unfortunately, they don't see the cost of this. And uh, in, in my defensive programming talk, I go over this in a lot more detail. Um, so management's not going to care. They don't care if you're using refactoring tools. They don't care if you're using Visual Studio Analyze. The 
they don't care. But you should care because you're going to have to be fixing that code or adding adding features to it, right? So um, you have this has to be important to you. So there's tons of ways of learning code quality books, of course, um, community events like this one, uh, code camps, you know, um, Azure Saturday or whatever, uh, Azure Global Bootcamp, online training, um, Plural Site. Have a I have a subscription Plural Site all the time. And uh, you should too. And uh, uh, so do online training. Uh, look at websites. You know, hopefully you'll uh, uh, register on my website because uh, I'm also I'm releasing stuff all the time. Um, tools that I use. Uh, I, I can't get into the tools in this talk, but I use Code It Right for .NET Framework code. Um, I use Analyze for everything. Uh, code Cracker I like. Uh, Ghost Doc, Productivity Power Tools, Code Rush. So use tools. Um, they really make these things easier. And the cool thing about tools, even the ones you have to pay for, like Code Right, is it actually teaches you and teaches your other developers, right? Uh, because you know, most of us, if we keep doing the same thing wrong, we're going to learn and stop doing that behavior, right? And so tools really help you with that. So these are the products you need. Like I said, I use Code Rush from DevExpress, and you can get a free copy of Code Rush if you buy a copy of my book, or if you just watch my show on Saturdays and you just have to watch it. There's no giveaway. You just watch my show, you get a free copy of Code Rush. And it's a real copy. It's not a stripped down, it's a .NET Dave copy. Um, if you're using .NET Framework, I really uh, suggest using uh, Code to Write from Submain. We makes it really easy to analyze your code and fix it because Code to Write will do most of the fixing for you. Analyze won't fix anything. You have to fix it yourself. Uh, Ghost Doc is free from uh, Submain. If you're not using Ghost Doc to document your uh, you uh, do XML commenting, you need to. Uh, so get GoStock, it's free. And Analyze, Visual Studio Analyze is free. Oh, we have a new member. And in my survey, you know, 30, 33% <laughs> of companies don't provide any apps. And actually, 100% of all the companies I go to don't provide any of these apps. So, uh, uh, but my survey says 33. And one thing I say a lot is, is, um, uh, I'm gonna, uh, yeah. Just demand code quality in yourself, in your projects, and in the apps you use. That's why if you follow me on Twitter, Twitter, I'm always bitching about software. And it's because I'm a software engineer. <laughs> and I know this can be done better. Um, so um, I, I'm almost done. Um, the one thing I wanna plug real quick is uh, my latest uh, project to help the kids in the slums in India. Um, you know, in 2019, when I was in India, I visited a orphanage in uh, one of the slums in Delhi, which was a really hard moving experience. But um, so anyway, because of that experience, I joined up with this NGO. And because um, when I was there, if you look on the right hand side there, there's a woman sewing. They have vocational training. When I was there, it was shut down because they didn't have money for it. And so on the way back from um, Delhi, I decided that all the all the money from my code performance book is donated to the Voice of Slum every month, and, and I've been able to get the vocational training going again, which I'm really happy about. And so, if you buy the copy of that book, I don't make any money. Unfortunately, it all goes to the Voice of Slum, but I wasn't happy with that, and so uh, I started a new project called the Hello World Cookbook, which is going to feature uh, food recipes from geeks just like you and me. And so I'm getting recipes from all over the world. I need more uh, so I can complete this project. But 100% of that, the ebook, the printed book, the merchandising, all that stuff will go to the Voice of Slum. So if you, if someone in your family cooks, I don't care who it is, uh, go to helloworldcookbook.com and submit a recipe. Um, I'm constantly working on recipes. Um, I tweeted about it this weekend. I was work, I was, I was perfecting my chili recipe. Um, and if you don't cook, uh, you can also sign up to be a unit tester to test the recipes for me. And uh, you can uh, sign up to help with the uh, editing of the book. And also, I need some graphic artist help, too. So lots of ways to help. But this is my new pet project to help the kids in India. And I hope you'll help me help them. So here's uh, my uh, resources for this. It's all up on my blog if you uh, don't get this. Of course, my book is the biggest resource. 328 pages or something like that. Um, there's my article about reuse, reuse and more code reuse. If you want to go check it out, please. Um, 
I, I really suggest the Clean Code by Corey House and uh, C Sharp Best Practices by my friend uh, Deborah Carrada and uh, on Pluralsight. So go check that out. Pluralsight's always doing free months, and you know I think they're doing 33% off right now or something like that. Um, uh, some of the information at the beginning of this talk is from this video of my friends uh, who are a lot smarter than me. Uh, my, my, my good friend, Willie, Woody Zool, who created uh, Mob Programming, and my other friend, Llewellyn Falco, who is super brilliant. Uh, go check that video out if you want. I think that's, that's it. Yep, so that's it. Thanks for attending, all six of you. And, uh, <laughs> And uh, I don't have videos on demand anymore because no one was buying them, but there's where you can get my book. There's how you can contact me. Please contact me if you have any questions. Uh, I'm, more, I'm always more willing to help people out. Uh, besides my full-time job, that's all I do pretty much. <laughs> um, but anyway, that's it. I'm sorry I went over time a little bit. Oh, thank you so much. The debugger there alone was like worth it attending. I think that's pretty awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Debugger display, you know, that's oh, yeah, I, like, so, I really like that one, yeah, yeah, because like so many times I run to it and I just kind of ignore it, saying I'll just drill it in and look at it, but yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah, so nice. Yeah. So, thanks for yeah. that. It makes it a little bit easier. I mean, you, you still can't see the values, all the values inside the object. I mean, there's <laughs> other ways you can do that, uh, but that makes it easy. And I always try to pick something that makes it really identical, like an, an ID or a, a, uh, an email or something like that, right? Yeah, makes sense, um, yeah. So, I anybody have questions? Notes. I really appreciate it. So, so, <laughs> uh, stuff. I'm gonna get the book too, and uh, and everything myself because it seems like some really good information that just is gonna help. I, I wonder about like the coding standards, like itself. Is that something that you try to keep as like a document that you um, do, or is it through more of like what you showed here, where it's code examples, and that you just kind of try to enforce it through code reviews? And um, well, my book is the documentation, right? Gotcha. And so. For me and all the teams I work on, you know, that's the documentation. And okay. usually, what I what I talk about when I do this talk in, in at companies is or at, at conferences is is buy my book to start your documentation and then create your own. Unfortunately, you know, there's no one real documentation anymore. And that's that's actually why I wrote my book. I my the first release of my book was in 2005, and you know, the reason I even wrote the book was because you know, I started out mainly in Visual Basic, and back in the Visual Basic days, you know, Microsoft had one document with all the coding standards in it that we all followed. So, so we all were writing pretty much exactly the same, right? Even if you look wow. at articles and books, there was all written the same because everybody followed that document. Um, unfortunately, you know, when Microsoft went to .NET, uh, uh, .NET, they didn't do that anymore. Right, they 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 don't have a single source of coding standards anymore, and the editor config makes it even worse. So um, yeah, um, there's no one source, and so that's why I work real hard at trying to make and making sure that at least the most important things are in my book, um, and or I I write about them. So if I do write about coding standards, they'll also show up in a future version of my book, right? Okay. So the book and my the book and my articles go hand in hand pretty much. Usually the articles come out first nowadays, and then I add them to the book. Yeah, um, yeah because my, I only do the book every two couple of years, right? And you know, I'm always coming up with stuff that you know needs to be done better or differently, and things like that. Like you know, one of the new new things I've been getting into, I have to actually be doing a lot of it this week, is um, you know, in my open source project in my NuGet package. I have a, a class in it called validate. And, and the reason I wrote that was it has a bunch of uh, methods in it that makes it really easy to validate your parameters coming into your types, right? Because I say, because I, I say, you know, with encapsulation, you have to check everything coming into your type, right? So I wrote this big uh, 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 class called validate, which makes that super one line of code, right? Mm -hmm. Makes it super easy for lots of different types in .NET. But something that you know, Donna, um, have added recently are these attributes where you can kind of do the same thing, right? So they have these new attributes now, which I'm putting all through my open source project 
And in, in your parameter, where your parameter is defined, you can put an attribute at the front of it called not null. Mm -hmm. right? and, and what that does is it forces the, C, the CLR to check it for null before it even gets into your method, right? So that's a, not only does it make your, clone, your code much cleaner, but it gets trapped faster, right? Because it doesn't even hit your method, right? Wow. Um, it, that, most people didn't hear about code contracts when they came out, but that's kind of the way code contracts work back when code contracts came out. Yeah, I kind of I vaguely remember, I, yeah, it never caught on, like you said, but it was, I, I, yeah. it was interesting stuff, yeah. I love code contracts, but they abandoned it. But, but now I still wish they had code contracts, uh, but this gets a little bit closer because now it's checking before it gets the method, right? Okay. Um, so there's these new attributes they have now. Some are checking the data coming in and some are checking the data coming out, actually. It's, it's pretty interesting. So, um, for example, we're in my entire open source projects, you know, the first line of almost everything is checking for null, right? So um, I have validate a dot check null parameter, null param, right? That's It's throughout my entire code base if you go look at it now. But I've removed all those in the last week. Right, and now I'm just using not null. Ah. Right, so if you're just checking for null and for your data coming into the type, yeah. not null um, is uh, is just as fast as calling the method I was doing before. I actually earlier this week I actually did benchmarking to prove that you know my validate um, method is the same speed basically as not null, because so I wanted to make sure not null wasn't slowing down my code. So I did um, benchmarking this week to prove that it doesn't. So, um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is new things come up all the time, right? And so I usually write about them first, and then they go into my book when I when I get ready to do an edition. And my book is in – that's the seventh edition of my book. So, wow. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Yep. Any other questions? I know some of this stuff I had to go over quickly, but you know, just not enough time. See, I ran out of time anyway. You know, it's, one no, hour really. is never enough. Yeah, one hour is never enough to talk about this stuff. You know? <laughs> no, it's not. And uh, when we did our like in-person ones, it often go two hours and things like that. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that well, when I ran the user group here, we our user group is three hours long. Wow. Wow. Nice. Yeah. Every <laughs> month. I did that for twenty years. <laughs> Uh, Until I retired, yeah. <laughs> um, well, so thank yeah, you. So, so the next book I'm working on is my code performance book. I hope to put uh, – I'm working really, really hard right now on the benchmarking for all that. Uh, the benchmark – you know, my, my code performance book is from over 3,400 benchmark tests, which actually take two days to run. That's how comprehensive my be the, the benchmarking I do for my code performance book. So I'm working on a new edition right now uh, that will come out probably sometime early next year. Nice. Yeah. Very cool. Um, I think Joe posted a survey, but I don't see it in my chat. I don't know, Stan. If I don't you, see it either. You're on if you would, uh, if you because I think it, it only shows you the chat after if you were on when he posted it. You know? Oh um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, so I think if yeah, I don't some, know, if some people know, came late or, or something like that. If not, I'm sure Joe will send out a survey by email. Um, it, that'd just be something that could help out David and get any feedback to, to him about this. And and um, make works. sure you say this was the best session you've ever <laughs> seen at the user group. And, you know. <laughs> so important. <laughs> and he'll um, uh, but yeah, anyone who registered will also be entered for the drawing to win a. Job. It was a very good session, David. Appreciate it. Thank you, and hopefully, sometime in the future, I can come. I like. I don't like doing meeting. I don't like doing sessions virtual. I be part of the reason that I like going places. Yeah. You know, so I'd love to come to uh, to where you guys are, and and uh, you know, last week I spoke in New York, and I'd love to go there. I think I've only been in New York State itself once when I was a tiny little kid, and. Um, <laughs> Because I'm originally from back east, uh, but I, my, I guess my parents never went there very much. Um, 
All right. We'd love to have you. I don't know if we can live up to your expectations when you like did your shows in India, but we would love to. Have you. <laughs> we'll try to get a tour guide. I don't around Lansing a little bit, you know, and things like oh, that. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but it'd that, be great. That is fun. But when I go to India, they 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 send me on uh, tours in India too. Yeah, so nice. <laughs> go to Taj Mahal, you know, and stuff like that. Uh, uh, in 2018, I spent two whole days just me and um, Matt Torgerson, who's the architect of C Sharp now. Yep. Me and him just touring around Delhi by ourselves. It was uh, cool. and, and a tour guide and a tour guide, of course, and. Uh, uh, and I, that's where I got to know Mads and what a great person he is and everything. And so that's one of the things I really love to do when I go places is to experience the, you know, the local area and go around and do things and stuff like that. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Well, Any other you. questions before I go? Please feel free to email me. Like I said, please follow me on Twitter. I'm always tweeting stuff every day. And, uh, and and also, please don't forget to watch my show on Saturdays at, at 10 a.m. my time. That's what, uh, 10 a.m., so that's what, 1 o'clock, you guys? Cool. Yeah. 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 Check that. yeah. Oh. Well, really appreciate it. There's a lot of great information, and, um, you know, so nice of you to do this for us. So, oh, one more thing I want to plug is uh, C Sharp Corner, who produces my shows, um, is having a 10-day Azure event next month. 10 straight days of virtual Azure conference sessions. So if you go to csharpcorner.com, you can go register. Please please go check that out. It's going to be really amazing. It'll be the longest Azure conference I've ever heard of. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. But very awesome. and I, think, I think I'll be on some of the panels, so I'll, you can see me there too. All right. I'll stop talking, otherwise I'll keep talking. So. <laughs> All right, thanks again, Dave. Yeah, thanks, yeah. Sam. And thanks everybody else right. who showed up and uh, tell tell your other members they really missed out. Absolutely, <laughs> they did actually. <laughs> they really did. <laughs> um, but the the meeting will the has been recorded and will be posted on YouTube later, um, and then the links will be sent out for uh, YouTube as well as the uh, uh, the eval. So. We'll uh, we'll reach them one way or the other. Cool. Great. Thank you, Sam. Well, thanks for All having right. me, everybody. Thank you, Thank you David. Thank you. Bye, Dave. I see you. Bye. Good night, everyone. Bye.